Hi everyone, it's Theodora and I'm here with Scottish mezzo-soprano Beth Taylor to talk about her career in Europe. She is at the start of a very promising international career. She's sung at Opéra de Lyon, Opéra de Lorraine, Aix-en-Provence, and COVID permitting will be singing at Deutsche Oper Berlin and La Monnaie. She is one of the winners of the Wigmore Hall International Song Competition, and I'm just so excited to talk to her today. I want to start talking about auditions because you have a really promising career and you've been singing all over Europe. And I was wondering, what is your focus in auditions? Of course. <laughs> okay, well, this is a very, very individual thing. Everyone will have very different uh, motives. Do they, is it about just being heard? Is it a specific role that they're after? Um, sometimes you, you catch a scent that that house is looking for a certain role that you feel you would fit perfectly. Um, I think at the end of the day, the auditions for me, and it's the advice I would give to anyone and certainly one I carry with myself, the, the audition is about presenting an option. You don't necessarily have to be the product, but you are an option and you want to be a good option. Um, we simply can't get everything, but you certainly don't want to be the bad option. So it's just about being a good option. No, you know, and you, if you know you might not get that job, but it was for a good reason, you know, there was just somebody who did fit that bill that little bit better that time, then, then it's okay. Um, obviously, you want to go in and be the most professional. Things will happen. The voice might crack at something the pianist might play at a speed that you're not happy with and there's maybe not been enough time to to remind them of the tempo you prefer that's always going to happen but i think it's about being professional and about being somebody that you know they will get the feeling that they want to work with you that you're you're easy to work with um that you can make negotiations and demands without being uh over the top that you have good reason for asking such things so it's not about just you know bending over and let and let everyone else take charge you, you have that you have control but in a very controlled way <laughs> great thank you and so you have been singing all over europe and auditioning all over europe have you noticed that there's a difference in expectations depending on where you are it's funny i thought all these places would have their own system and their own way of doing things and um, you know when I was training at the RCS everyone was talking about uh, you know in Germany you've got to know everything about your Fach and actually from what I've discovered uh, Germany are rather open-minded about the modern singer and the demands that are expected of us therefore actually we have a lot to offer you know but, I don't think there's a huge difference um, when you go between Italy, France, Germany, for example. Those are the three main European countries that I've auditioned in. Um, I think they're more interested in the individual. At the end of the day, you're going in as an individual. You're not going in as being uh, part of a system. You're going in as being an artist. And I think the houses are quite open to that now. Um, I, I can honestly say I've noticed a huge difference between France and Germany. Um, you're obviously, there's cultural differences, but you, you also notice that cultural difference going in and ordering a cup of coffee. Um, so I don't think it's anything to be worried about. I think you have to prepare for every audition uh, very much to your own tastes and how you want to come across, not how they are. Um, because you also just don't know who's going to be. You might be in Germany, but half the panel could be French, you know, and you just you just roll with the punches, you know. Um, stay individual and stay true to yourself, really, is the main thing. Uh, I couldn't agree more, and I've talked to, you know, a couple people now, and that's been one advice that they would give to young artists is stay true to yourself, because anyways, everyone's going to have so many opinions that you might as well be happy with what you present. So that way you can't have regrets. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, it's a hard enough job having the inner critic. Um, don't add those extra complications in by thinking that if you're in the French system, they're going to want to hear more of this or less of that. It, it's not about that. It really isn't. Your voice will suit certain tastes and not others. And um, we're, we're all hoping to make an income out of this at the end of the day. And I think when you're starting out, um, and you get that first contract through, 
you know, and you look back and you thought, why was I so worried about that audition? You know, I thought so and so was there, so I thought they would eat me alive, or you know, there's no need for that, really. It's you know, enjoy that process. I think that's wonderful advice. So for all these auditions and for all the work that you've been getting, I imagine there's a lot of travel that goes with that. Do you have any tips for taking care of vocal health while you're traveling? Well, I've never traveled as far as the US, so I've never done a huge long haul thing, but uh, there have been times where I've had to go from, say, somewhere like Luxembourg to France. You know, I've had an audition um, just, you know, in Lorraine, which is quite close to Luxembourg, and then I've had to go to Lyon. So, you know, we're talking about like 13 hours on a bus because it was the only way I could do it. And sometimes you are left with very few options, but taking that horrendous train journey or the milk train, um, as I sometimes call it. Um, I think for me, a decent sleep has had the most obvious effect. Um, I am a huge advocate for getting a really decent night's sleep. I'm not saying you have to spend hundreds of pounds on a hotel or I don't think that's what it's about. I think it's about getting yourself in, in a good routine that you know after a certain time you need to switch off, get off the screen or whatever, getting yourself in a good routine because this career can really throw off a routine. So if you have an audition routine, try and stick to it as much as you can and your body gets into it and you know it, it feels more routine. Auditions become a lot less scary when there's a routine involved. Um, and I would also say, uh, as someone who's a huge caffeine addict, um, but for the sake of looking after the voice, you know, I, I try and treat myself to a coffee after an audition, try and reward myself in a small way after an audition. I think we focus a lot on punishing oursel ourselves after something that didn't quite go right. Um, I always say for every job you didn't get, put a little bit of money aside. And it's amazing how much money you can rack up from the rejections at the end of the year. You can buy yourself something quite nice. Um, but even you could even make that for after an audition, you know, always make sure you've got a little bit set aside in your budget for a treat. If you know, if you like hot chocolate, get a hot chocolate. If you if there's a museum you want to go and see afterwards, make sure you have fit in that time to go and do that for yourself. Um, I always try and buy uh, a recipe book from the from the local area. I'm a, I'm a big fan of cooking so I always like to pick up little local cuisine delicacies and things for afterwards so that's usually my post-edition treat along with a really big cup of like extra strong coffee. <laughs> that's amazing I I don't do that but I'm gonna start doing that I think I think that's really good <laughs> positive reinforcement for auditions. <laughs> um, yeah I'm trying to think of other things I do like I have a little straw that I, I take around with me so yeah sometimes I, I do there's there have been weeks where I've done two auditions in a day and then one the next day and then one next day. so you know you're doing several auditions in a week and that's quite hard going mentally if nothing else so you need to make sure you have those things that bring you back down again um from that high and the inevitable crash as well so that's really important for your voice as well um and just knowing when to be quiet enjoying your own company as well as the company of others. It's great to see friends if you're in a city where you know you have some friends or from a previous gig or whatever, but also have that time for yourself in quiet, I think is really important for your vocal rest. Would you be okay talking a little bit more about your audition um, prep or your routine? Yeah, no problem. So I'll take an example from last year where I had a, as I say, I had, I think I had a, I called it an audition tour. I pretty much had an audition every day for two weeks um, across Europe and it finished, I planned it so that I would finish in Florence where I had a concert. So I had all these auditions and then a concert at the end of it. So it was a challenge in terms of pacing, um, the mental, you know, uh, preparation, you know, always being ready to pre present myself professionally being ready for whatever would come my way, you know, that the piano wasn't in tune or, or the accompanist hadn't arrived or it, you know, the, you've lost one of your photocopies, you know, there's this whole variety of things that can, that can go wrong. Um, but I would always aim to get up really quite early and I'm not great at an early rise, but I always aim to get up early, get a bit of fresh air and get a good breakfast. Um, 
obviously depending on the time of your audition you might be somebody that that doesn't like to eat a lot beforehand but I would try and aim to eat a little something because I find an empty stomach your your adrenaline it just it can be quite overwhelming otherwise um warming up isn't always so easy of course if you're in a hotel I actually stay in a lot of hostels so I can, I'm sometimes sharing a room with loads of other people um I have a fantastic little device that masks and sort of covers the singing a little bit so it isn't so loud um but ideally i try and organize um i'm quite lucky that i have an agent that can request on my behalf that there's a warm-up room and checking what time that's available from from but if i can get to the theater first thing um just to get a sense of the space that's always good as well i like to see the theater especially at that time last year it was this was a whole new world for me i'd come straight out of college and i hadn't actually sung on a proper theater stage before i hadn't had that opportunity quite at college because i hadn't done on opera school um the leon opera studio was my first time singing on a stage and even then that the venues were quite different and suddenly i was standing at the deutsche opera berlin looking around at the stage going right how do i know the voice is going to carry how do i know i'm ready for this and you've just got to kind of go for it and trust that you can but it's always good to see that space so you're not totally frightened by it um beforehand um you have make sure you have a warm-up routine that you are really you, you are certain works for you you know that really it will get moving the last thing you want to do is do a warm-up that you think will work and then they ask for a piece and you go ah darn it, I didn't warm up the collar too round enough or whatever today, really have something that encompasses everything that you want to present that day. Um, other than that, sometimes you've just got to be really uh, flexible with the day. Um, I find the weather can make quite a big difference as well if it's really rainy or if it's, if I'm not great with heat, I've noticed I, I my voice dries up a lot in really hot places. So if I, I have to get up really early and accustomed to that climate, um, before the voice is really working it's probably just me being a bit silly but I do find that it makes a big difference <laughs> I would like your perspective on Europe what they expect for you to bring to an audition I think Europe UK certainly would want they usually suggest four or five areas um, of uh, sometimes they might ask for something in a specific language or if they know you're going in with a certain role in mind they might obviously ask for something from that era or work um having said that although i always i have my five core areas that i like to use um i'm always trying to build up on my repertoire and if i've got some other areas that i'd like to have with me it's amazing how many panels have gone so what else do you sing and you can always say you have something else of that style. So even if it's not in your five, um, if they want, if they go, ah, actually, yeah, I would be interested to hear how you approach this or how you would do that, because you have no idea what light bulb has gone off in their head. Some opera you've never heard of, some contemporary thing, you know, try and, um, you know think about that it's you might that you might sing oh i don't know don elvira and they might go right well i've heard five don elviras today who were great also um but how would you approach carmen for example and you might just have the right color that they go ah right okay perfect or have you ever sung rossini before how is your you know and it's amazing how much of a, a difference um an impression you've left them with by going actually as it happens i've got a little bit i've been working on it's early days but perhaps you'd like to hear a little bit of that so have your five that you're most happy with the ones that you know you can nail every time i say that touch woods obviously again things happen sometimes you stand there and you go <gasps> with a piece that you know and you you completely forget the first line it's rare but just accept that these things happen it's the gift of live performance you just never know what's going to happen um but yeah be flexible to offer something else um find something a wee bit quirky and unusual you know i, I know they say you should have your standards and i agree don't just go in with loads of random stuff but have the occasional flutter of something 
Um, people love that, I think. People love just something that they go, ah, yeah, remember her that did that really bizarre contemporary thing. <laughs> you have uh, auditioned all over Europe, but you've also worked a bit in the UK. And for now, I haven't talked to so many artists who are from the UK, and I would love your perspective on auditioning and singing in the UK. It's interesting you say that because actually primarily the work I have is in Europe, um, not in the UK. Um, I was thinking about this recently, I was talking to somebody else about this recently, about why um, I'm not being immediately sort of hired in the UK. Um, I think the UK, the UK uh, singing education system is, is quite heavily influenced by the European system. Whereas I think you can tell a singer from the US quite clearly from a singer from Europe. But I feel like Britain can fit in quite well with Europe. Um, however, I think it's very open-minded to voices of all kinds. That's really nice to see. You know, we're not all just throwing ourselves in on really enormous big birdie voices or, you know, there's a real balance. You know, the UK has a really good Baroque scene as well that I think um, is growing uh, in influence uh, and popularity. The UK education singing system in the conservatoires and colleges, there's a kind of underlying link between them and say big festivals like Glyndebourne, Garsington, Grange Park. These are really well known international festivals and the huge amounts of the, their chorus members are drawn from prospective college students. And I think that's something to remember when you're going into a house like that or a festival, that it's quite, for want of a better term, it's quite incestuous. Um, I find it's more incestuous than in Europe. Europe's quite happy to hear singers from, from all over. The UK is a very saturated market and it's a very small island at the end of the day and they are quite keen on keeping their own. Um, and when you're a young singer looking for income and experience, naturally when you're at college even if you want to be a soloist you're normally the norm is to apply to chorus jobs um i did this and i was rejected from all of them um i've actually never worked professionally in a chorus in the uk um which i always said was to my shame but i i, I don't see it as a as a shame in the same way that I wouldn't see anyone who has worked in a chorus as being less of a soloist but there is I think an underlying sense of if you have some chorus you've kind of got to work the long way around to become a soloist it's so odd because you know we're, we're talking three or four decades ago that wasn't the case there were the top singers of that generation came from chorus and got solos and worked their way up but that system seems to have changed now um so i found it really difficult to get in as a soloist um from that because some people have seen i've applied for chorus and i've gone oh, she's maybe not what we want as a soloist. And that's fine, that's their opinion. So I'm hoping that the more that I'm working in Europe and gaining the experience as a young soloist, um, that the trust that the European houses have given me so far, <laughs> that um, the UK will hopefully realise that there are lots of ways one can become a, a, a fully fledged soloist. Um, so if you come from the US or Europe and the UK is a little bit, um, they kind of shut their doors on you immediately don't take it personally there's just a system that has to be broken slightly um and i think that that will change again over time thank you for sharing your perspective on that and i have no doubt that they will soon change their minds um, <laughs> you placed third for the wigmore hall international song competition and i know that you've done competitions and it's not like your main thing by any means but i was just wondering did you feel like that allowed you to have some exposure and were you happy that you did it or did you feel like maybe you could have spent your time elsewhere oh boy oh boy uh, yeah. competitions are a big buzzword aren't they for that for singers um so the wigmore hall coming third in that was such a surprise i, I think um i used to be really really frightened of competitions i still am i have to emphasize that i still am I continue to do them because I'm trying to get over that fear. Um, I'm determined not to let it get the better of me, but unfortunately I found I'm probably not somebody that naturally goes in with a, a striking, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna, and most of us are not like that. And, and um, 
I think there's a great opportunity to be had out of comp competitions for exposure. Absolutely. That's how you should approach it. You should see it as the opportunity to stand and sing. See it as a free audition. The problem is the word competition has a lot of connotations in our heads. And um, I think we put way more pressure on ourselves than we need to for them. And me personally, I look back at all the competitions I've done, including the ones that I've been really lucky enough to win or place in and audience prizes and things. Every single one of them I've looked back. Sometimes they're recorded and I can watch back and I'm going, oh, I was so nervous. You know, and I can tell I'm nervous. I'm doing stuff with my hands that I wouldn't normally do or my eyes are glued or they're wandering. Or, you know, I overcompensate. I've got a great fear about not, um carrying in a space and the Wigmore is the most generous space that was not a space I ever had to worry about but even then even when I got to the final I still felt like I had something to prove and I think when you're a singer and you feel you've got something to prove a competition can be really damaging um so I think when you're if you want to start doing competitions to be heard that's great you absolutely should do them but go in and have very, very small goals, really small goals. And for everyone that you achieve, that's great, you know, and don't make a competition um, take over the priority of actually enjoying the singing and, and don't make the competition the aim, make the singing well and singing true to you the aim, like in an audition. Um, don't treat it any differently. Um, we would all love to win prize money. I, I know it can make a huge difference between somebody being able to afford to go and do auditions. I, I know for some the competitions are a necessity, um, but I think if you can focus more on your product and your your package, um, and take the take the advice that the panels give you, but also be willing to let go of advice that you don't agree with I think there's a great fear that you have to take everything on but I've sat in a panel where three members love what I did and the other two that stopped me placing first or whatever because they didn't like what I did um, in fact one a perfect example was half of the panel loving the repertoire that I chose in an own choice program and the other half hating it and that conflict was enough to lower me a category wise and I can't control that at the end of the day I have my own I make my own decision about an own choice program usually it's because it's something that I connect to if it's a if it's a recital program and if it's something I've invested in I'm I don't think it's fair for me to sit and accept that it was the wrong choice if it was the right choice for me not for the panel oh well um and the panel responded I seem to remember a few of them said to me, well, you know, you're in it. You have to learn to please your panel. That's what's most important. And that really put me off competitions for some time because some of those people were singers themselves. And I found that really shocking that a singer who's been there and seen it all would think that that's appropriate. And if there is that secret of you must please your panel, I feel that really has to change. And the only way we can do that is when singers are brave enough to take that risk and be themselves. Um, it might mean that you don't always win the prize, but you'll look back in years and know that you had your own image and your own thing, and that, that's more important. I couldn't agree more. And I kind of think, feel like it's a recipe for failure to try and please everybody because it's literally impossible to please everybody. It's such a subjective industry that, I mean, that's an impossible and very stressful task that you would set for yourself. Um, so yeah. And you just don't know what's going to happen in the moment. I feel sorry for people that prepare for months for a, for a competition, as you should. You should get your repertoire accurate, get the language up to scratch, um, you know, learn about the you know, what, what do you want a panel to see in you? Do you want them to see you exactly as you are now, which I feel you should, or are you trying to give more of an impression of what you potentially are? Say, if you're a young Wagnerian singer, do you, do you want to show them that potential side so that they keep an eye on you? Depending on what age and stage you're at, 
um, the competitions you really can tailor to yourself, even if it feels like you're following all their rules and regulations, you can make it your own. You have an agent. So I was wondering, is there any self-managing on your end? I would say, I'm first of all, I'm extremely lucky to have the agent I do. He really goes above and beyond. Um, he's pretty much in charge of his own thing, you know, and he's, I think because I'm a young singer, he, he really has taken my hand and slowly guided me through this you know I've never felt out in deep water but I know that that can be the case for a lot of singers starting out if they've signed on with the first agent that's offered them work because I understand sometimes getting an agent is really important um, they, they do do a lot of the work the, the, they, their job is to market you and if you can get somebody to do that that does take a huge weight off your mind Having said that, I also would say that I like to be proactive in my own promoting. I was very lucky to meet my agent sort of by accident at a concert, and I happened to know him through someone else. But in the lead up to that, anything that I, you know, jobs that I had got was through word of mouth completely. And I had built up in the UK, like local choral societies, I had started to build up a good reputation. Um, and I intend to keep that. I, I still want to be someone that people speak positively about, no matter what agent I've got, you know, or, or you know, who's representing me. Um, because at the end of the day, I've got to imagine that if I was to pay myself to speak well about myself, what would I want to be said about me? Um, yeah, I think you've still got to go in. You've got to be organised in getting the audition rep ready. An agent doesn't do that. My agent doesn't book my flights or anything like that for me. That's all stuff I have to do. He'll say in the diary, are you free to go to this place at that date and everything? And he's very aware that, you know, rather than me flying back, forth, back, forth, if he sees an opportunity for me to go to, say, some to Berlin for three days, then to, you know, to audition for a couple of places there, then go to Cologne and then, you know, do a little Germany tour and then go back. It saves me a lot of money in the long run. It's, you know, more exposure for your buck, as it were. But um, you've also got to, you have got to decide whether that's what you want or do you want to go and do one audition that you have one focus and you know nail it and that's that for some singers the idea of doing five auditions in a week is just too much and I can completely get that because the mental struggle is quite intense um we, we're not ones to speak positively about ourselves all the time so I think it's quite hard to go in and constantly have that self-belief so sometimes you need more energy for that um I think you have to be if if an agent says right so and so would like to hire you for this contract and it's in six months time and you're looking at the music and you're like mm, this isn't you it's not something that you would immediately say is in your comfort zone you have to figure out you know and say you've got 101 other things going on if, if you're fortunate enough to have all that going on you've got to think to yourself right do i really realistically have the time to do that so in the self-management and it's not an agent's job to decide whether or not you're ready for something. If you've got an agent who can go, so-and-so offered you this role, but I didn't think it was the time, then great. If you've got someone who's that wise and that knowledgeable about young singers, great, but it's not an agent's job to do that. So you have to talk with your teacher, your coach. You have to really think about yourself and your energy. And do you want to do 101 concerts good? Or do you want to do... 50 really well or you know that's, that's far too high a number but you know do you want to do eight roles that year well you know but knackering or do you want to do three but absolutely outstanding you know that really that you know are, are really going to make you stand out um and yeah I, I think if you've got a good agent they're not going to push you to do anything you don't want to do for the sake of money an agent wants a, a, a product that will continue to give them money. They don't need one hit wonders. They need singers that, will, that even if it means that they're, they're just at the beginning, they're slowly developing. 
you know, a, a really good agent wants that. And you've got to remember that when you're looking for representation, you want an agent that hopefully has had a lot of years of experience and also has a lot of years of experience of working with young singers that are still with them, that are still developing, have built up gradually. That's, that's a really good thing. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm now at the point of the interview where I ask everybody the same question. Um, what do you wish you had known earlier? Mm, I wish I had known of, I wish I had known just how much you can offer in a single moment. Um, and that if you really believe in the music and really get lost in it, it's amazing how much better the singing is uh, rather than heavy focus on, I must sing like this because this is what all the really good mezzos or sopranos are all sounding like at the moment. I, and I think I'm, I'm still learning to, to like my voice exactly the way it is right now, even for all its faults and everything, it's very easy to get angry. So I think, if I was to ask myself this question again in 10 years time, it would be to tell myself to remember the, the beautiful passage in that bit of music that you love and really love it in that moment. Don't go, oh, okay, here we go again. It's that moment where I've got to, I've got to look like I'm enjoying it, but I really wish I was still in my bed or, you know, you really keep choosing to sing, keep choosing music and keep choosing you, keep choosing your voice. Don't, go well I'll do it the best I can but I know they're going to want that person because they've got that kind of quality or that person's slimmer or that person's got a different colour of hair or at the end of the you are an option um, you're always an, an option and a good option at that so I think you always have to choose yourself as the option know when you're standing there that you're doing your absolute best and you have every reason and to be there. And do you have any advice you want to impart to the young artists of today? Oh boy, oh boy. I, I, I mean, as a young artist myself, um, if you've got the time now, I know opera is a wonderful industry and that, that's obviously where most of us get the majority of our income is from opera and we need to keep that industry alive song and oratorio are surprisingly um i feel like they're given secondary priority at colleges and things but i think as a young singer you can learn so much about the voice from singing songs and i think you learn a lot from language and nuance of language from song text and i think as a singer you really have to learn to love poetry and religious texts if you're not particularly religious try and connect to oratorios in your own way i think oratorio repertoire is some of my favorite in all of music i love singing oratorio and i you know i'm looking at oratorios just now while with all this covid business i've got more time to sit and look at some bach uh, cantatas that i've not looked at um some handle ones as well uh, elijah i've never looked at mendelssohn elijah there's some oratorios that I think you always want to be ready in case you get that phone call going, have you possibly sung Graham's Requiem before? Could you possibly come and say, you want to be able to go, ah, yes, yeah, yeah, I have. So if you've got the time, learn those important song cycles, learn those oratorios, um, including the little recipe bits, really learn, study them, not just operas. Plenty of time for opera when you're a young, when you're a young singer, that's all to come. But I think your oratorio and song um, should also re be really well studied. Beth, thank you so much. This has been really great. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. <laughs> For those of you listening at home, please subscribe to her YouTube channel. And if you want to read more about her, visit her website, www.bethtaylor.com. I'm Theodora, and we've been in the wings with Beth Taylor. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel. And if you have questions you'd like me to ask in the future, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. I hope you can join us next time.